The battle lines are being drawn for one of the biggest budget battles the Illinois State Capitol has seen in years. Hello, I'm Jack Titchener from Illinois Lawmakers. This is Illinois Lawmakers live coverage of Governor Bruce Rauner's first budget address to the Illinois General Assembly. I'm joined by Capitol Facts editor and publisher Rich Miller and from Illinois Public Radio, the State House Bureau Chief Amanda Vinicky. Uh, we are awaiting an official briefing on the governor's budget message, but Rich and Amanda, you've both you've both seen some of the details. What what are we going to be hearing in the next hour? Carnage. <laughs> I mean, this is this is the uh, these are the, some of the biggest, broadest cuts that this room has ever seen. Perhaps the biggest. Um, I, I mean, he, he's zeroed out funding for orphanages, right, for orphan care. He's he's cutting uh, uh, the arc of Illinois, eliminating state funding for it. He's cutting... Uh, disabilities, you know, that is. Right, uh, uh, developmental disabilities. He's cutting funding 31% to uh, higher education. That's about uh, $400 million right there alone. I mean, yeah. Really, it's pretty much across the board. We'd heard from Bruce Rauner that he wanted to make greater investments in education. This budget, we believe, will do that. But everything else is cut pretty drastically. And, of course, that comes on top of years of previous cuts. Illinois' budget has been struggling. Legislators say that they went deep into it, but others would argue that they just kind of nipped at the buds a bit. Instead, really, Rauner is now taking an axe, not a scalpel. What yeah, kind of point, that. what sort of point is the governor trying to make with this? Well, I think he's trying to make the point of, I don't want to raise taxes, and therefore we have to do these things uh, to balance the budget. Um, he's, he, he's got a pension plan that supposedly saves $2.2 .2 billion in the first year. I'm not so sure about that. People I've talked to can't see how the numbers work. Um, but, you know, they've spent and spent and spent and spent for decades in this chamber and across the hall. And he's coming in and saying there's not going to be a tax hike. There's going to be cuts. And here are the cuts. It's either the reckoning or there is the theory that this is a buildup to make the case for an increase in taxes at some point in time later on. Maybe there is that path later on down the road. Perhaps Rauner wants somebody else to be the one to introduce that. He's a Republican that doesn't play to his base. It's not what he wants, but go ahead, Democrats, if that's what you believe, you have to bear the brunt. It remains to be seen. It's clear, though, from the depth of these cuts that he believes at least a majority of them wants, he wants regardless of a tax increase. He thinks that's necessary to get Illinois back on track. The applause you hear right now is Governor Bruce Rauner making his way to the uh, speaker's well here in the Illinois House of Representatives where he's going to uh, issue his uh, budget message in just a moment. Rich, uh, Speaker Madigan said yesterday, my advice to the governor is you can't cut your way out of this. Yeah, he's probably right. I mean, the reaction to these cuts is going to be loud and furious more um, uh, than, than anything we've ever seen. Um, it's <sighs> finding votes for a budget like this would, looks almost impossible. And On now, top of, uh, of course, Rauner has already really upset a lot of legislators because of his and now stance Governor, on unions. Governor Bruce Rauner with a budget message. Good afternoon. President Cullerton, Speaker Madigan, Leader Redonio, Leader Durkin, Lieutenant Governor Sanguinetti, Attorney General Madigan, Secretary White, Comptroller Munger, Treasurer Freyricks, members of the General Assembly, thank you for attending today and thank you for your service to the people of Illinois. Over the past week, we've commemorated the life of Illinois' greatest leader, Abraham Lincoln. In the lead up to his signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, President Lincoln delivered a letter to Congress, writing in part, the occasion is piled high with difficulty and we must rise with the occasion. We must think anew and act anew. While the challenges before us are very different than those that faced our 16th president, here in the land of Lincoln, we recognize that the road ahead, our road to a more prosperous future, is a difficult one. And like President Lincoln's 
call to Congress, we too must think anew and act anew. We must be willing to take actions we'd rather avoid and make decisions that may seem unpopular in the short run, but serve the best interests of the people of Illinois in the long run. The budget outlined today is the budget Illinois can afford. And that in itself is an example of thinking anew. Because for far too long, we have been living beyond our means, spending money that Illinois taxpayers could not afford. This budget is honest with the people of Illinois, and it presents an honest path forward. Like a family, we must come together to address the reality we face. Families know that every member can't get everything they want, but we can pay for what we need most. And we can reform our system so we are able to invest more in the future. Because the task before us is so large, all our challenges cannot be solved by a single budget. It will take time to restore Illinois to fiscal health. Now is the time to start on a responsible path after years of financial recklessness. <laughs> Instilling discipline is not easy. Saying no is not popular. But it is now or never for Illinois. It is make or break time. Before we can address next year's budget, we must first solve the current year's crisis. As you know, the current budget was $1.6 billion in the hole when it was signed last year. And the prior administration directed state agencies not to control their costs. As a result, we are in the middle of a crisis that gets worse every day. The child care assistance program is out of money, and families are worried about how to care for their children. Court reporters will start missing payroll next month, threatening to grind our justice system to a halt. And our state prisons will start missing payroll in early April, making them unable to fulfill their most basic operations. Everyone in this chamber understands the severity of what is immediately in front of us. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, Leader Redonio, Leader Durkin, thank you, thank you all for allowing your staffs to meet with our administration these past weeks to find a responsible solution to our immediate budget crisis. It, it appears that we are very close literally days away from a resolution. And every day counts. Members of the General Assembly, now is the time for action. It is time to solve this crisis. Let's continue the Child Care Assistance Program. Let's keep our courtrooms open. And let's keep our corrections officers on duty. Let's put the people of Illinois over partisan politics. Solving this year's crisis will eliminate $1.6 billion from next year's deficit. Let's get it done. 
But even after we solve this year's crisis, we will still be left with a budget hole of $6.2 billion for the coming fiscal year. This huge deficit is the result of years of bad decisions, sleight of hand budgeting, and giveaways we could not afford. This is not the result of decreasing tax rates. Some in the General Assembly are eager to discuss new revenue. There's at least one. But before revenue should be discussed, reform is essential. Before we ask the people of Illinois to pay more to fund state government, we must ensure taxpayers are getting value for their money. Asking for more of the taxpayers' hard-earned money without fundamentally reforming the structure of state government would further erode public confidence and accelerate our decline. Waste and inefficiency are rampant in our current system. Illinois government is currently designed to benefit those inside the system rather than those working families throughout our state. We must institute major reforms or whatever balanced budget we craft together this year will be undone in the years ahead by the special interests that make their money from the government and pay politicians to spend more. We must eliminate conflicts of interest in state government and end our broken system. These reforms won't be easy. Decades of special interest laws will be difficult to undo. But to be compassionate, we must be competitive. And that means having the political courage to put the people's interests first and the special interests last. Our top priority for financial reform must be our pension system. That is true regardless of the Supreme Court's decision on SB1. Even if our pension systems were fully funded, taxpayers would still be on the hook for $2 billion. But our pension systems are not fully funded. They're currently $111 billion in the hole, the worst pension crisis in America. As it stands right now, one out of every four dollars taken from taxpayers by the state goes into a system that is giving more than 11,000 government retirees tax-free six-figure pensions worth as much as, in one case, $450,000 per year. Without reforms proposed in this budget, nearly 25 cents of every tax dollar will continue going into a broken pension system instead of into our social services safety net, into our schools, or back into the pockets of taxpayers and small businesses. That is unfair and it's unsustainable. And it changes with this budget. Government employees deserve fair and competitive benefits. But we cannot continue to raise taxes on all Illinoisans in order to fund the retirement benefits of a small fraction of our residents. The pension reform plan in this budget will protect 
every dollar of benefits earned to date. And let me repeat that. This is core. This is core of this issue. The pension reform plan we are proposing protects every dollar of benefits that have earned so far. What you've earned, you're going to get. And if you are retired, you get everything you were promised. That is fair and that is right. But moving forward, all future work should be under the Tier 2 pension plan, except for our police officers and our firefighters. Those who put their lives on the line in service to our state deserve to be treated differently. And I believe the public will stand with me in this single case of special treatment. This budget also gives employees hired before 2011 a choice to take a buyout option, a lump sum payment, and a defined contribution plan in return for a voluntary reduction in cost of living adjustments. It's time to empower our workforce and address one of the biggest fiscal challenges we face. These reforms will yield more than $2 billion in savings in the first year alone. And, and this is critical as well, and by bringing health care benefits more in line with those received by the taxpayers who pay for them, we can save an additional $700 million per year. We recognize that some of these reforms cannot be achieved through legislation alone. Some must be achieved through good faith bargaining. And I hope that those on the other side of the table are as committed as I am to achieving the types of meaningful reform that are necessary for Illinois' future. While the state tightens its belt, so too must local governments and transportation agencies. The amount of money transferred to local governments in Illinois has grown 42 percent over the past decade. The state currently transfers $6 billion every year to local governments. Those governments are currently sitting on more than $15 billion in cash reserves. Think about that. The reduction in local government sharing in this budget is equal to just 3 percent of their total revenue. Along with this modest cutback, our turnaround reforms will reduce unfunded mandates and give local governments and voters the tools to save hundreds of millions of dollars through consolidation, employment flexibility, and compensation restructuring. Similarly, waste and inefficiency can be cut from the complex web that comprises our public transportation structure. Statewide, our public transportation agencies spend billions of taxpayer dollars. Our budget reductions for the state's largest transit agency amount to less than 5 percent of its overall budget. And here, too, the proposals in our turnaround agenda give our transportation entities the tools to save hundreds of millions of dollars. Reining in these costs allows us to minimize reductions in other areas of the budget. For Medicaid, our budget reduces costs significantly while maintaining eligibility levels for most lower-income Illinoisans. We plan to re-implement many of the Medicaid reform measures that were enacted just a few years ago by you. And they were well done, well thought out. We are going to re-enact those, re-implement those. Many of them have already been undone in recent years. By re-instituting the SMART Act 
and prioritizing our redetermination efforts, we will save hundreds of millions of dollars. Our budget will also reduce costs by fixing our broken criminal justice system. Far Far too many offenders return to prison within three years of leaving. A vicious and costly cycle. Our prisons are overcrowded. Our corrections officers are overworked. By reforming our criminal justice system, we can make our prisons safer, rehabilitate ex-offenders so they become productive members of society, and save many tens of millions of dollars for the taxpayers. <laughs> Taken together, our turnaround reforms, along with the difficult but necessary choices in this budget, will enable us to invest in our future. Making these tough choices is a small price to pay for the promise of a better tomorrow for our children and our grandchildren. In the gallery today, we are joined by students from Lincoln Community High School in Lincoln and Lanphier High School and Lincoln Magnet School here in Springfield. This budget allows us to invest in them. We are going to invest in you and all the school children in our state. For years, state support for education has been cut, even when it didn't have to be. It's time to make education our top priority again. And that <laughs> and that's what this budget does. We start by increasing high-quality early childhood education options for our most vulnerable children. Every dollar invested today in early childhood education saves us more than $7 in the future. Increasing funding for our youngest is the smart and the compassionate thing to do. This budget also increases K-12 education funding by $300 million. <laughs> Helping school districts in our state that most need our support. We have much more work to do together to make our schools among the best in the nation. But we are proud of the commitment we're making together with you in this budget. What we propose today is a turnaround budget. It improves public safety, provides care for our most vulnerable residents, boosts funding for education, and restructures the core costs of state government that are holding us back. However, while this budget begins to fix our financial problems, the only real answer to our challenges is to become pro-growth again. We need, <laughs> we need a booming economy. More small businesses and entrepreneurs starting here, and more people and businesses moving here. If we don't take action now to expand the economic pie, the people of Illinois will forever be left to fight over smaller and smaller slices. Our citizens deserve a path to economic growth and empowerment. And that means putting people first and special interests last. To grow our economy, we must enact meaningful workers' compensation reform, unemployment insurance reform, lawsuit reform, pension reform, and tax reform. We've got to freeze property taxes. They're our most punishing taxes in Illinois. 
Cut the red tape. Cut the red tape inside state and local government and let people control their own economic destinies. We need to end the corrupt bargains inside government and the, end the conflicts of interest in our government. We need to finally let the people have their say on a term limits amendment to the state constitution. If we make these reforms, we'll be laying a solid foundation for economic growth and prosperity. With reform, we will be able to invest more in education and give our kids world-class schools. We'll be able to invest more in our social services safety net to help our most vulnerable residents. And we'll be able to invest more in our infrastructure, which is critical. The turnaround plan here reflects President Lincoln's call to think anew and act anew. In it, we end the irresponsible and reckless practices of the past and make sure they don't happen again. <laughs> we make difficult choices that no one wants to make, but it's what this occasion requires. And it's what we were all elected to do, make choices based on what's best for the next generation not for the next election. This is our last best chance to get our house in order. Let's get it done together. Thank you all very much, and God bless you for your service to the people of Illinois. Thank you. Ask Governor Bruce. Ask him, ask him Governor Bruce Rauner just uh, wrapping up his first budget message to the Illinois General Assembly. Not very much in the way of specifics in terms of what he proposes to do. No. Rich Miller and Amanda Vinicky join us now on the set of Illinois Lawmakers. No, he didn't talk about a $100 million plus cut to DCFS, and he didn't talk about um, a very old school kick the can down the road thing that, that he slipped into this budget today. They're going to delay payments on employee health insurance uh, by several hundred million dollars. So in effect, just pushes that problem a year or two down the road. They already have, in some of these funds, a one-year backlog on health insurance payments. Amanda, he talked a lot about uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in savings by reforms. Reforms, he says, are necessary before we ask for any form of new revenue. Well, in part, it's all what we've heard from Rauner previously be it work comp reform, lawsuit reform, what have you. He also has a new pension plan. The problem is right now we don't have any detail on any of these. He says it will save about $2 billion by allowing people to keep the benefits they've earned thus far, but then moving current workers into this tier two plan that saves a lot of cash, but there are plenty of problems with some people say already is illegal because it gives workers so few benefits. We don't we don't know. Is it going and, to and actually get that, these savings? But if a judge stops, if a judge puts a hold on that pension law, if they do manage to pass it, it blows a $2.2 billion hole in next year's budget. Which so, is already over $6 billion. Well, right. So it's, that's a very risky, almost a fantastical thing to do. The one responsible thing that this chamber and the other chamber have done in the last couple of years was they didn't bank any savings from the pension reform law because they knew a judge would stop it. To try to pass a law in May and then start banking the savings in July is extremely risky. Unlike previous years where the governor's budget staff would do a budget presentation to the reporters and the agency heads and the leaders the night before, uh, we're not going to see the actual details until probably 2 o'clock this afternoon. And even then, it's just taking the governor's word. The staffs of the various legislative leaders haven't had the chance to work it out, see if the governor is accurate in his projections or what have you. The fallout of this, however, is going to be a whole lot of cuts. People already aren't happy. This speech, of course, didn't detail a whole lot of that. He noted we're going to make a few cuts to state governments. They can handle that. Some of these cities have... Uh, reserves that they can dip into. 
What was left out of that, of course, was that plenty of communities don't have those reserves. They're struggling to pay their bills, and coupled with his plan to freeze property taxes, that'll make it even tougher for municipalities. He didn't talk about cuts to higher education. He didn't talk about a whole lot of what his budget plan also includes. He heralds the parts that, yeah, it may make people a little bit queasy, but really the highlights, Sue's it over. That's what his speech is for. Nonetheless, there's a whole lot more that he didn't right. say. And what he didn't also say about local governments is, yes, some of those reserves are quite high, but a lot of them, you know, you get the money that comes in from property taxes, and then you put it in a bank and hold on to it and then spend it gradually. That's what a lot of those reserves are. Rich, Rainy Amanda, thanks, thanks very much up. for your <laughs> thanks very much for your analysis. We're going to get re uh, details and reaction from the legislative leaders next on Illinois Lawmakers. This is Illinois Lawmakers live coverage of Governor Bruce Rauner's budget speech to the General Assembly on Illinois Public Radio and Television. The budget outlined today is the budget Illinois can afford. And that in itself is an example of thinking anew. Because for far too long, we have been living beyond our means, spending money that Illinois taxpayers could not afford. This budget is honest with the people of Illinois, and it presents an honest path forward. Like a family, we must come together to address the reality we face. Families know that every member can't get everything they want, but we can pay for what we need most, and we can reform our system so we are able to invest more in the future. Joining us now on Illinois Lawmakers, Democratic House Speaker Michael Madigan of Chicago. Mr. Speaker, welcome back to the program. You told us yesterday downstairs coming out of a meeting with the governor that uh, your advice to him has been in recent days to, you can't cut your way out of this, you need more revenue. Yeah, uh, this is one of the differences that I have with the governor. Uh, the governor is telling us that he thinks that he can eliminate the budget deficits because we're working on three budget deficits, the current plus the next two. The governor feels that he can work his way through the deficits, eliminate the deficits, simply by cutting spending by the state of Illinois. I disagree. I think that you have to do both cuts in spending and new revenue, which is the reason that I'm supporting the imposition of a 3% surcharge on millionaires' income over a million dollars for education. 3% surcharge on millionaires for education. Uh, at this point, the governor has uh, talked about, uh, uh, t in generalities, a lot of different savings that would be realized by following his blueprint. But as last word, I don't think you, even you have actually seen the details of what's in there. Well, I'm prepared to wait to get the details because my pledge to the governor, it's a continuing pledge, is to work with him cooperatively and professionally. In today's speech, he didn't give much detail. That's understandable. That's okay. We'll wait for the details to come forward. But let me repeat, I don't think you can work your way out of the budget deficit by cuts alone. I think there has to be a blend. Cuts in spending plus new revenue, like the imposition of the 3% surcharge on millionaires' income over a million dollars. The Civic Federation uh, recently issued kind of a, a, a laundry list of suggestions uh, toward fixing the budget, including re, uh, reimposing the temporary income tax increase, going back to 4% perhaps, uh, doing a lot of other different things along the way. Would that be, uh, in your view, a pathway? Well, again, my general premise is we should eliminate these budget deficits, beginning with the deficit in the current budget. I don't think you can just cut your way out of the budget deficits. I think you need to blend cuts in services and new revenue. Now, I'm not going to start commenting today on what the revenue sources would be. I would simply say we will need some additional revenue in order to balance the budget. Well, let's talk about the discussions you've had in recent days with the governor about uh, trying to uh, deal with the current one and a half billion dollar hold in the FY uh, 2015 budget. Uh, he wants broad powers to, 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 to try and do that. How much are you willing to, to uh, latitude are you willing to give him? 
Uh, I think we've had some real good, fruitful discussions with the governor and with the uh, staff in the governor's office. Uh, their goal is to eliminate a deficit in the current budget of about $1.6 billion. I share that goal. I think we ought to strive to eliminate that deficit. Uh, we have a complete open mind on how to do it. There's a variety of things that can be done. Some of them ought to be done. The governor said that we're within days of a resolution. I would agree with him. It is a matter of days before we get a final resolution as to how we can eliminate the deficit in the current budget. This longer discussion, though, about 2016 will take a lot longer. There's an old saying around here, the governor proposes, the legislature disposes. Is that plan dead on arrival, or do you want to see more detail? Well, naturally, I want to see more detail, and I'm not going to declare anything DOA. I don't do that because I know the nature of the legislative process. I understand the relationship between the executive department and the legislative department under the Constitution of the state of Illinois. It's a very collaborative arrangement. And if everybody conducts themselves and negotiates in good faith, the people of the state will get a good result. Is it possible at some time the governor's budget, as proposed, will get an up or down vote on the House of the House floor here? Well, my plan is to proceed with the normal budget making. Uh, we're already scheduling committee hearings for agencies to come before the committees and to tell their needs for the future budget. There will be bills that will appropriate money for spending by the various agencies. They'll be called before the committees. They'll be called before the House. We will engage in the normal collaborative budget making. We're very pleased that for the first time in years, the Republican members of the House will join us in the budget making because they've been absent for several years. And that's an interesting point you make. Uh, they've been on the sidelines for the last 12 years, I believe. Um, as you look at the uh, head count here in the House of Representatives, there's 71 Democrats, 47 Republicans uh, to pass a uh, budget bill. How many Republican votes is Leader Durkin going to have to put on that bill? You need 60 votes to pass a bill. I would hope that there would be a good blend of Democrats and Republicans supporting a budget. That's, that lies ahead. And there's a lot of difficult decisions to be made before we can call a bill on third reading. Uh, at this point, uh, going back to 26, 2015 and filling the current hole, the governor, we understand, has asked for $2.5 billion in what are called statutory transfers. Those are funds normally going to municipal governments, mass transit governments, uh, mass transit systems as well. Will you give him that? That's one of the items that's under discussion. There's a whole variety of items that could be adjusted in the current budget in order to balance out. I think it's important to move to another area here, which is the question of pensions. Part of the governor's proposal is to spend $2.2 billion in anticipated savings from his pension proposal. You may recall last spring, after we had passed Senate Bill 1, the governor had signed the bill, the legislature declined not to spend anticipated savings. We thought that was the prudent thing to do. Unfortunately, Governor Rauner, in my judgment, is proposing some reckless action because he wants to spend anticipated savings before the bill is litigated before the Illinois and Supreme we, Court. And as, as you say, we don't even, we have no idea at this point what the Supreme Court will do. Speaker Madigan, thanks very much. Always good having you on Illinois Lawmakers. Up next on the program, we're going to hear from the Republican side of the aisle here in Springfield. Members of the General Assembly, now is the time for action. It is time to solve this crisis. Let's continue the child care assistance program. Let's keep our courtrooms open. And let's keep our corrections officers on duty. Let's put the people of Illinois over partisan politics. <laughs> Solving this year's crisis will eliminate $1.6 billion from next year's deficit. Let's get it done. But even after we solve this year's crisis, we will still be left with a budget hole of $6.2 billion, 
For the Joining us now on Illinois Lawmakers, House Republican leader Jim Durkin of Western Springs and his Republican counterpart from the Senate, Senate Republican leader Christine Rodonio of Lamont. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, today, uh, a lot of cheering from and applause from the Republican side of the aisle, not so much on the governor's birthday from the Democratic side of the aisle. Your reaction overall to what he's put on the table well, today? Well, you know what? It's refreshing to hear a governor who states that we're going to live within our means, that he's given us a revenue number that uh, he wants to spend this year in this year's budget and that uh, he's allowing the legislature to participate and work towards getting to that number. But the fact is we're not going to spend more than what we bring in and that's refreshing and that is what we have for years have been talking and railing about on the floor. We've talked about it in campaigns. So Illinoisans finally will see a real budget, one that uh, revenues will match up with spending. Yeah, I don't think anything that he said today was particularly surprising. I think for the most part, people understand that Illinois is in dire circumstances, and we absolutely need to change the way we do things. This budget address was sort of a reset um, that tells the people of Illinois there's going to be a very big difference in state government going forward. Um, Speaker Madigan, when he came out of the leaders' meeting that you all had yesterday with the governor, said, Governor's going to put some, this is going to be a message full of tough medicine. Now, he admittedly did not go into much in the way of detail today, but what we're hearing about some of the briefings that you've all received about what's actually in this budget proposal, a $1.5 billion cut to Medicaid, deep cuts to other human services programs, a higher education cut to state universities of around 31 uh, percent, big changes in the state's uh, uh, pension yeah. systems. When are you expected to see those? I think that it's important to remember, though, that he provided a lot of context for some of these cuts. So, for example, with the 30 percent university cut, it's less than 6 percent of their overall budget, and they have $2.5 billion in foundation money. With some of the human and service cuts that he's proposing, what he's provided the context for and that is that there are other ways to access those services, some through Obamacare, some through other programs within the state. We've gotten, we've gotten to a point where we have a lot of duplication in this state at this point. A budget address is a blueprint, as I said earlier, in which the legislative caucuses can work together and find ways to either make some changes to and make recommendations to this governor. But he is going to hold firm with the spending in Illinois, and I think that it's very clear that we can no longer sustain the past practices of what's been going on in this building for the past 12 years. At, at some point, as Speaker Madigan just said on the program, there will have to be Republican votes on whatever budget bill goes through this place. Under what conditions would Republicans be willing to, A, vote for this budget, and B, perhaps more importantly toward the speaker's point of needing more revenue, uh, asking for more revenue from the taxpayers of Illinois. I didn't hear the governor talk about asking for more revenue. The He's speaker did. Well, the governor did not ask for that. So we will work with the speaker to craft a budget that stays within the framework of what this governor had laid out today, but also is at that number, that revenue number in which he believes is responsible, the number that we believe will be brought in uh, through through various, uh, spent, various taxes through the year. Uh, but I will say this, that I'm glad to work with the speaker as they have over the last year. So this is not the first time Republicans haven't participated in the House. We wouldn't have passed pension bills out of the House last year without Republicans. So we're glad to work with them. We're glad to work with them on a responsible, fair budget. You're, you're a runner, uh, Leader Rodonio. You, uh, this is kind of like the green flag at the starting gate to get people going. Well, uh, but the I finish say, line's <laughs> a long way from here. Well, yes, this is the starting gun. It's not the checker flag, that's for sure. There's a lot of discussion to be had, but I think this is a very, very good starting point and a very clear message that we need big-time change. Some of these cuts, though, are going to hurt people in districts that are, uh, well, all over the state, they're going to uh, Medicaid cuts will impact people with I'm not Republicans, sure that's true, Republicans though. and Democrats. I'm not sure that's true. That's going to be the narrative coming from the Democrats that um, people are going to be dramatically hurt. But again, you have to look at how things have changed around us. Obamacare is in place now. There's access to medical services that perhaps wasn't there before. We have created a lot of duplication within state government that has not been looked at in 14 years. So I think before we jump to that conclusion, we need to evaluate what we have and not jump to the conclusion it's Darkon. But I think you also need to recognize that we are still fighting a $1.6 billion deficit for this fiscal year in which this governor wants to ensure that child care 
uh, uh, funding is going to be maintained, that our court reporters will be funded, and also that our prison guards will be able to get their paychecks. So this is not an insensitive governor. We're going to be making some tough decisions. But let me just say this. We have to address FY15 sooner rather than later. If we do not uh, find a, a resolution to this, this unbalanced budget, which he inherited in January from the Democrats, we're looking at approximately $3 billion of more liability for the next revenue cycle. Speaker Madigan seemed to indicate, or seemed to agree with the governor that you all may not be that far apart on coming to an agreement on how to plug the $1.5, $1.6 billion in the current fiscal year. That's my understanding, and I believe that we are moving in that right direction. I would hope that we'd move at a quicker pace, but uh, I do believe that there's an understanding, at least my discussions with uh, my counterpart and also uh, Senator Redonio and also Speaker Madigan, that we uh, uh, are seeing some movement. One of the points that uh, the governor made before there's any sort of talk around this building about uh, raising any kinds of new revenue, you've got to have significant reform on many different levels. And one of the biggest, of course, comes in pension uh, for pensions for state workers. That's about $111 billion unfunded um, hold at this point. Uh, it's before the Supreme Court. It's anybody's guess what's going to happen there. But the governor is building $2.2 billion in pension savings into his budget for the coming year without knowing what the courts are going to do. Well, I think a lot of that is going to be also intertwined with the AFSCME negotiations and, uh, and how, we, uh, how those go along. And that's our largest public sector union of state employees and will probably be affected by any pension bill will be that union. How much but I do believe it's a very bold uh, you know, proposal by the governor because our pension systems are the worst in the nation. So I'm hopeful that the Supreme Court does um, uphold what we did last year. But I believe, as we all agreed when we walked out of the meeting uh, a year ago when we negotiated this bill, that more needs to be done. This is a start. And at this point, uh, the governor's budget recommendations for 2016, they're not actually in bill form yet. When do you anticipate seeing that? Um, I think they'll be drafted and probably filed, if not this week, um, when we come back. Mm -hmm. Who's going to sponsor that in the House and Senate? Um, I believe I'll be sponsoring I'm the I'm glad Senate. to sponsor it in the House. Yep. Okay. Uh, a question having to do with... The governor, a few weeks ago, reportedly told the House Republicans and the Senate Republicans, I'm going to need you on 10 important votes this year. And if, if I don't have you on those votes, there's going to be trouble. Well, I was actually in that meeting, and that was not quite reported accurately. So um, I think we need to be careful <laughs> hearing second and third hand reports of things. All right. Senator Rodonio, uh, Representative uh, Durkin, thanks very much. Always great to have you Thank on you. the program. Next on Illinois Lawmakers, we're going to hear from the Democratic Senate President of Illinois, John Cullerton of Chicago. But even after we solve this year's crisis, we will still be left with a budget hole of $6.2 billion for the coming fiscal year. This huge deficit is the result of years of bad decisions, sleight of hand budgeting, and giveaways we could not afford. This is not the result of decreasing tax rates. Some in the General Assembly are eager to discuss new revenue. There's at least one. But before revenue should be discussed, reform is essential. And as promised, last but not least, certainly, the Senate President of Illinois, uh, John Cullerton of Chicago, Democratic leader in the Senate. Good to have you back on the program. Thank you very much. Uh, today, a, uh, a proposal laid out uh, for the General Assembly to realize hundreds of Billions, hundreds of millions of dollars in savings, but very little in the uh, way of detail on how we reach that, uh, that goal. Your reaction? Well, we just heard his address, so we're going to have to study his budget. He didn't release it uh, beforehand. Uh, but the biggest problem I see is with his proposal on the pension reform. If we pass the bill, and remember, it was very difficult passing the last pension reform bill we passed. Um, m many of the Republicans didn't support it. Um, it'll undoubtedly go to court. There'll be a lawsuit just like the last pension bill that's currently in court. And that bill that we passed before has already been declared unconstitutional by a judge. And we knew that this was going to be litigated, so we didn't uh, bank any of the savings that we helped to get from Senate Bill 1. 
But the governor has proposed that he wants to spend $2.2 billion that uh, uh, we undoubtedly will not get in the next fiscal year. The only other alternative is to skip the pension payment of $2.2 billion, and I'm not in favor of that. That's, That's how we got in our trouble in the first place. It, so he's going to have to fill that hole. It's clearly the most blatant hole in his budget, that $2.2 billion. At this point, too, you still got a billion and a half dollar hole in the 2015 budget. I remember the last time you were on the program, you said, Jack, uh, we're only going to get to about mid-year with what we've been able to patch together, and well, here we, we are. We, we, we didn't surprise anybody. We yeah. passed the budget last year. We said um, we, the previous governor, Governor Quinn, said he wanted to keep the income tax at 5%. Had we done that? we clearly would have had enough money for this year's budget. So we're going to sit down with the governor. Uh, but one of the big problems that the governor has proposed in this, both budgets is to take money away from the local governments. Okay? Now, I don't think that's a cut to the state budget. I think that's a shifting of cuts to uh, the local governments or property tax increases, which he says he's against. So, for example, in the city of Chicago, the city of Chicago next year will lose $120 million dollars. Uh, that we would not be giving them. That's the equivalent of uh, 1,100 or 1,200 police officers being cut. So we don't want to do that. I, I, if there's some local governments that have a bunch of excess money, uh, we should find out about he that. He says they're sitting on billions of dollars. Yeah, maybe we, should, maybe we shouldn't give them any money. But the, 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 the impoverished communities that need the money, um, I, I think, uh, are, are going to... Be, be entitled to it, or there's going to be property tax increases or first responders being laid off. That's not a good idea. One of your concerns had to do with who's going to bear the burden of what cuts are imposed in this budget. As you see it now, where will the burden of those cuts go? Well, apparently he wants to help people who are going to preschool and uh, high, high school, but when they get to college, he wants to cut them. Uh, that is a very strange uh, attitude to take about supporting our institutions of higher education. So that's a major problem. There's a good number of human service providers that are, are providing basic services for disabled kids and for seniors and people with alcoholic problems. All those things are proposed apparently to be a massive cuts as well. So that doesn't sound very compassionate for those people who are in that position. Now Medicaid, um, those cuts, uh, we already did that. And we found, for example, that if you cut people's dental services and then they don't go to a dentist, they end up going to an emergency room and it costs us more money. So we went back and re-examined that and made a, a, a change with the Republicans in a bipartisan fashion. He seems to want to reverse that as well. There's over a million and a half children who are on Medicaid. Uh, and there, where, where does he think these cuts are going to affect? Uh, this, I, that doesn't sound very compassionate. So the, that's a problem. For the us. two Republican leaders said, well, that's... We don't, think the, we don't think the figures are going to be nearly as draconian as the Democrats are, are making out because in the time since the SMART Act was approved, or approved the Medicaid Reform Act was approved here, there's been a lot of uh, uh, change at the federal level. Obamacare is pumping more money in. People can take advantage of that. Is there, eno is there enough there to offset that? We've done a tremendous job in our Medicaid program such that uh, we are 49th in the nation in spending per patient. That's very efficient. But if he wants to cut the rates that we pay those doctors and hospitals, they'll stop taking Medicaid patients, in which case those folks then will just end up going to emergency rooms, which cost more money. So this is something we have to really examine closely when we, uh, when we go through the budget. Your, your House colleague, uh, uh, House Speaker Madigan, said here, his message over the last 10 days to Governor Rauner, and you've been in those, those meetings too, has been, this isn't something you can cut your way out of. You're going to need new revenue of some form at some point. What, what's still on the table in well, your I'll look mind? to the governor uh, for that. He has proposed a budget that, as I said, at a minimum, there's $2.2 billion that he's short. He's not going to get those savings from the pension reform, uh, and uh, we're not going to not fund pensions. So he's going to have to come up with some proposals to fill that, that goal, that hole. It's his budget. He's the governor. So at this point, uh, at some point in the next few weeks, the Republican leaders in the House and Senate will put this into bill form, and you'll, you'll start looking at the budget-making process is already underway. You, you, you have Senate Appropriations Committee experts like uh, Heather Staines going through the numbers. What is, in your view, is going to happen in the next couple of weeks here? Well, we're going to have the Republicans be at the table. They've not voted for one budget in the six years I've been the Senate president. We're looking forward to them voting for a budget, and we want to get their input. 
uh, and we're going to have hearings, and we're going to try to help people understand what we do. A lot of people don't follow state government up in the Chicago area, and they don't know what this means to them. And so we're going to have an opportunity for them to learn how these cuts that the governor's proposed, how it affects them in person. Uh, in the past, there's been, an, uh, there's been a practice of taking an unpopular idea like Governor Blagojevich's gross receipts tax, doing a committee of the whole meeting here in the House, having all kinds of testimony on it, and then uh, shooting it down. Well, uh, that's more a practice that's used in the House than the Senate, uh, but we'll, we'll see. We want to make sure we work in a cooperative way. People want us to come down here and be bipartisan, not to play games, and, and so I'm looking forward to working with my counterpart, Senator uh, Redonio in doing that. Based on what you know so far, is the governor's budget proposal as it stands dead on arrival in the Senate? I wouldn't use the word dead on arrival, but obviously there's a huge $2.2 .2 billion hole in it because of pensions. I know that the city of Chicago cannot afford to have $120 million cut out of their budget. If anything, we need to give them more because of their own pension crisis. So those are things which are going to be a real problem in terms of passing uh, unless they're, 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 they're dramatically changed. So fasten your seat belts and make sure your trays are up and locked. It's going to be a long, bumpy ride here for a while. Well, it's different having a divided government, but uh, we're here and we're going to go work hard at it. Senate President John Cullerton, thanks so much for your time on Illinois Lawmakers. That uh, wraps up our live coverage of the governor's budget message and reaction from the uh, legislative leaders here in Springfield. We'll be back in May every week with weekly coverage of the spring session of the Illinois General Assembly here on Illinois, Illinois Lawmakers. From all of us at uh, the Illinois Lawmakers team, so long from Springfield.